response that he has to Mary. We'll come back to that. It's on the surface of it, it seems kind of weird. Hey, Jesus, we're out of wine. Big problem. He knows that. Jesus knows that there's a big problem. Obviously, he's God. So he would know the magnitude of that problem. And his response is, dear mother, or dear woman, that's not our problem. My time has not yet come. That's a kind of an interesting response to that. You wouldn't expect that from him. But there's something going on there. We'll talk about that. What else do you remember, Jackson? Um, Jesus told the servants to pull the jar to the top. To the top? And what was the reason for that? They would believe him because, think about this, if they're, if they're filling the jars all the way to the top, what does that eliminate? Talent? Um, if they're filling it to the top, everyone would think that he actually turned it into wine instead of saying that someone just poured wine into the jar. Exactly. So there's no wasted details here in the story. Everything has a purpose, a reason. The fact that he's having the, the, the servants fill these jars all over the top is because he knows human nature. Human nature is you, you and I will explain away miracles, at least attempt to. So if something genuinely miraculous happens in your life, you're going to be tempted to come up with some kind of scientific, human, logical explanation for it. Jesus knows that. And so, therefore, he eliminates that possibility. How? He, fills, he has them fill the jars all the way up so that no one can claim, oh, we have wine now because someone just snuck into that room and poured the wine in there, right? No one can claim that now because they, they were obviously filled. That means there's no other explanation for the miracle except God did a work, right? Okay, we'll get to that. Let's start here, I guess. What, where is he at? What is this, the context of this, this whole miracle? What's that? He's at a party. Okay. I want to make sure you get this, so I'm going to review it really quickly. What, what, is, what is this saying about God or Jesus that he's at a party? Maddox? Yeah. This is important. I want to camp out. I, I, I said this yesterday. I just want to make sure you got this. If you didn't get it yesterday, hopefully you hear this. Because there's a fundamental misunderstanding about God and Jesus in the Bible. Really. For some reason, a lot of people just assume that church, God, Jesus, are all like overly serious, remove the fun, uh, boring beyond all belief. And what you, what you need to hear and see here is the fact that Jesus is at this party, okay? Remember, he's invited. He's invited to this party, which means he could have said no, which means he said, the fact that he said yes is saying something about him. The fact that he is at a party tells you that he's good with good, clean fun. Now, he wants you to have good, clean fun. He's having good, good, clean fun. On top of that, he's the one providing the drink. I mean, let, let that sink in a little bit. The God of the Bible actually wants you to have fun. The issue is you can have plenty of fun, just don't sin while you're doing it. And as we said yesterday, the world has got this twisted kind of weird view of fun where they think that you can only have fun if you're rebelling in some kind of way. If you're doing something you shouldn't be doing. Right? You can have genuine fun and not sin. That, that, that is the biblical stance. Right? So God wants you to have fun. Enjoy yourselves. Enjoy your sport. Enjoy your relationships. Right? But the idea is you can have fun. Just don't dishonor God. Right? How do you dishonor God? By sinning. It's actually in your best interest not to sin. Sin introduces chaos and destruction and pain and suffering. Right? That, that there's, there's a direct correlation there. The more you're sinning, the more you're rebelling against God, the more, inter, you're, the more you're introducing chaos in your life. Broken relationships and bitterness and all these different things. It's, it's all stemmed from sin, right? So the idea is, again, none of us are perfect. We're all going to mess up. I'm not saying be perfect. We can't be. The idea, though, is with God's help, do the best that you can not to sin. But to think here that God is like, if you think that God and Jesus and the Bible and Christianity and Christians are all just, man, they're just boring beyond all belief. Or Christians are super serious all the time. There's no room for fun. That, that, that's not the God of the Bible, I should say. Okay, He's at a party. 
and we'll get to this in a little bit. He's creating the wine. The wine is the best wine they've ever had. I'll say more about that when we get to it. The fact that he's at a party, though, is evidence that he's all for you having good, clean fun. So go ahead. Have your fun. You can be a genuine Christian and have genuine fun without rebelling against God, your parents, the law, right? The world has twisted the idea of fun. Um, as a Christian, have your fun, just don't sin, right? Big difference. What kind of party is it? Wedding party. You can make the argument then that God is there for, what is his view of weddings? Pardon? Uh, weddings, like he's going to remarry people. Yeah, like he's for it. Just like he's good, he's for good, clean, fun. He's for weddings, marriage, right? Most of you, if not all of you, at some point will marry somebody. The vast majority of people do. Okay, this is in your immediate future. God's the one who put that idea together. I don't know if you caught that. Like, he's the one who came up with the idea of marriage. So the fact that he's at a wedding here, he's choosing to be at a wedding, shows that he supports marriage. Okay, as we said. There's a very specific definition of that, that the world is attempting to change and destroy. Okay, but the Bible is crystal clear that the marriage is one man, one woman for life, with a couple of exceptions. Death is one, and adultery is the other. Death or adultery, you can remarry. Other than that, it doesn't seem like there's any exceptions, right? But the idea is a lifelong commitment to one man or one woman. You get to pick. Okay, choose wisely. I would say. But the idea is God, that's God's idea. So if you think God's boring, uh, God doesn't, God is not that, God doesn't care about your fun. Uh, God's just a bunch of serious commands and is waiting for you to mess up. That, that's, a, that's a wrong idea. That's not the right picture of God that you have in your head. He's at a wedding, he's at a party. By the way, the last thing is, the fact that he's here, the last thing this shows us is that he's for people. This is a social gathering. He's, you can imagine that Jesus at a party is not like isolating himself, sitting in a corner, twirling his thumbs, right? He's engaged with people most likely. He's talking with people. We have no idea what he's saying, obviously. But the idea is he's at his social gathering. This shows that he cares about people. Do you? Or are you like a lone wolf that just is always alone, right? You don't really truthfully like people. It, the more you love God, guys, this is, a, this is from the Bible. It's, it's fact. Okay. The more you love God, the more you'll naturally love people. So if I asked you, do you love God, do you love God, do you love God, do you love God, all of you are probably going to say, yeah, of course. My next question would be, if that's true, then your love for people should be growing. That'd be perfect. You're still going to get annoyed. Right? But the idea is, over time, your love and care for people around you grows. That's a biblical principle. So if you tell me that you love God, one of the proofs is, do you actually care about your neighbor? Because they're connected. The more you love God, the more you'll love people. There's, there's no way around this, guys. So Jesus is, is constantly putting himself around people. Why? Because he loves them. Why is he on earth in the first place? Because he loves people. And he's choosing to be with people at a celebration. Okay, I can say a lot more about that, but for the sake of time here. He's at a party. He's approving the fun, having a good time. The problem arises. And the issue is, oh my gosh, you ran out of wine. Why is this a big problem in this world? Or really any party ever, probably. But especially in this world, why is the running out of wine a problem? I would say a big problem. Maddox? There's nothing to drink. And if there's nothing to drink, people are going to leave. People are going to leave. And when they leave, what's going to happen? They get mad. They're going to get mad. And when they get mad, what are they going to do? Don't, don't overthink this. What do you do when if you left a party? You're probably talking about it, right? Man, what a junky party that was, right? That I'll never come back to this place, right? They could easily say, man, remember that party in Galilee where they ran out of the wine, right? Making fun of them, shaming them, embarrassing them, right? This is a big deal to the host of this party, okay? Because realistically, they could be shamed for years, Right? They, they're deeply embarrassed, right? So it's also a, it's a shame culture, so kind of like ours, where like the second you mess up, people would jump all over you, especially in social media today. Like 
you say one small thing that's inaccurate or wrong or just whatever, and people will just send you, they'll correct you really quick and they'll jump all over you and attack you verbally. That's kind of the world we live in. Same here. They don't have any wine. They're going to be critiqued and criticized and made fun of and rejected for years probably. Right? So the problem comes to, to Mary. Mary does what as soon as she finds out? I'm going to speed up here. So she goes to Jesus. The idea is when you have problems, you go to God. That, that's what she's doing. If there's a big problem, she goes straight to God. Jesus, but God, Jesus is God. She knows Jesus is God from the first encounter with that angel, right? She knew that Jesus was the Messiah, so she knows that Jesus has the solution. She doesn't know how it's going to happen or what's going to happen. She just knows there's God here. God is here. He will help. She goes right to God. Do you? Do you go to God when life gets hard? That, that, that is a principle here. You should be. If you're not, try it out. We usually go to video games and TV and relationships and sports. We just we try and drown out all the pain with all the distractions, but all you're doing is you're ignoring them. You're not dealing with them. So they're not going to go away. They don't just disappear. you got to deal with them. Welcome to life for everybody. And what I'm saying to you as a Christian, go to God. Like, don't forget to introduce God into the situation, right? God, I'm dealing with this. Help me. Give me wisdom. Give me help. Um, help me to be, heal me, like provide, whatever it is. You're, you're turning to God for help. That's what she does right away. Turns to God for help. Hey, we have a problem here, a big problem. There's no more wine. And then this issue, what does he mean when he says, uh, my time not yet come? What is he thinking about? What does he mean here? Why is this his response? Mia? This could be a lot of what he just said, still knowing that the person he's going to marry is, is Christ the Son of God. Exactly. So when she comes to him and says, hey, there's a big problem, she knows that he can do something. He's like, <clears throat> you can imagine if you're Jesus, the main reason you're on earth in the first place is to sacrifice yourself on the cross. So you can imagine how often that would be on your head, in your mind. You'd be thinking about it pretty frequently. All right, so he's thinking <clears throat> exactly what Mia said. The, the moment I start revealing who I am by the power I have, people, I'll be put on the, on the map, so to speak. People will know who I am, and that will set in motion the end for me. And there's this you can imagine if you're Jesus, you're God, right? But he's also fully human. He's 100%, 100% God, but he's also 100% human. And in that 100% humanness, you can imagine like the cross has to be like this. It's his purpose. It's the reason he's there. He's actually looking forward to it to a point because he loves us so much. But there's also this horrifying kind of aspect to it because it's the worst death. It's going to be a horrible, horrible death. Ton of suffering. So there's, a, there's this balancing act between... I'm looking forward to it and I'm dreading it at the same time. And that's all built in this. The second you want me to do something, right? But my time has not yet come. The idea is this is going to lead to my death. Marriage response is do whatever. She, it's funny because she has, she has this trust in him, this confidence in him. He's going to do whatever, right? So let's fast forward a little bit. <clears throat> I'm sure you caught this part. We talked about how he, he had them fill the jars all the way up so there would be no doubt there was a miracle. We didn't say this yet. What happens before you see any miracle? <clears throat> Obedience. Big time point. This is super important to get. If you didn't get it yesterday, okay. Oftentimes, not every single time, but oftentimes God will actually draw humans in, not physically pull them in against their will, but the idea is he invites people to take part in any miracle event he's, he's about to do. For example, the feeding of 5,000, right? Before you see the 5,000 being fed, what is the command he gives to one of his disciples? We'll get to this in the Gospel of John later, but I'm just, as an example of this, before you see the miracle, you often see obedience in the miracle of the five, feeding of the 5,000. What, what is his simple command to one of his, his followers? Does everyone know that story? Uh, not, it doesn't be word for word. But what is the idea? What does he say to his one of his disciples before there's any miracle of multiplying bread and fish? I'm not 100% sure, but didn't he ask him to tell the dudes to get out of the stuff? Yeah, simple stuff. In this case, fill the jars with water. That's not hard. And yet it's a command. It's a test. Do you trust me? That, that, that's what he's asking. Do you trust me? I know what I'm doing. Do you think I know what I'm doing? 
And the test is, if you do think, you know, if you do believe in him, if you do trust him, you'll do what he says to do, right? So we'll get to that story in the feeding of the 5,000, but the idea is Jesus gives a command to one of his closest followers. It's simple. Have the people sit down, and uh, there's one other thing we'll get to when we get to it, but he, it's simple acts of obedience. And here, fill the jars with water. You can imagine if you're one of the servants, you might be thinking to yourself, especially if they're if they're analytical, logical, reasonable people, they might be thinking, Jesus, we don't need water. We need, we need wine here. We're out of, we're, we're, this is a crisis. Why are you telling me to fill this with water? Well, what does that have to do with anything? Right? And Jesus is like, do you trust me? I know what I'm doing here. And the idea, the idea is they do exactly what he says. They do, there's no like hesitation. They're like, they believe, they follow, they obey. Before you see the miracle, you see obedience. A lot of times. So, I said this yesterday, quickly, if you're looking for a miracle in your own life, it's possible, I can't guarantee this, but it's possible that God won't give you the miracle until you do your part. Maybe God's trying, maybe he wants you to pray for somebody. Like, you want, you want to see a healing in your friend's life? Maybe God wants you to go pray for that person on the spot. Whatever, it could be a bunch of different things. I'm just saying, has God commanded you or led you to do something specific? Are you doing it? Because a lot of times there's this obedience factor. Before you see any miracle of God, God wants you to do something as an act of trust, belief, confidence in him. Right. So they do exactly what he says. And then the response. What is the response of the party of the guy who's – this right here is the guy who's um, – his I'll, – I'll say this in a second. What is the guy's response? The guy who drinks the wine. Tom? He said, where's the best wine he's ever tasted? And what does that teach us about God? God does the best for us. God does the best for us. Gives us the best. God doesn't make junk. We said this yesterday, Genesis 1. After he made all the different things, what was the last line after everything he created? Good. Right? It, was it, was, it was good or perfect or very good. The idea is... Whatever God's into, whatever he's making, he's making good stuff. He doesn't make junk. He doesn't go halfway. Which, by the way, includes you. And I do mean you. God made you. Every single one of you. He put you together. He came up with the idea of you. Right? So he doesn't make junk. You're, you're good. You're very good in essence. Right? You have inherent worth. Okay? The, the idea here is I didn't say it yesterday. This guy has been to a lot of parties. That's his job. His job is to essentially make sure the parties are enjoyable. The master of ceremonies, his, his role is to ensure that people are having a good time. And this guy has no doubt been to a lot of parties, and he is blown away at the quality of the wine, which says something that God has his power to do this. Um, by the way, when did the wine, sorry, when did the water turn into wine? When did the, wa when did the wa water turn into wine? Do we know? After he sent his followers instructions. Okay. The dip sum, take it out of the master's ceremony. So the, the, ser the servants followed his instructions. When the master of ceremonies takes the water, that was now wine. The fact of the matter is we don't know for sure. We don't know when exactly the water turned into wine. Many people assume it's the second he, they take it out of the jar, they're dipping this thing into the jar, they take it out. Some There's guesses. People have different guesses, but we don't know when exactly the water turned into wine. It could have been that even when they dip it out, okay, even when they take it out, that it's still water until it reaches his mouth? We don't know. The point of why I'm asking that and why I'm saying that is because this miracle is insane. Like, 150 gallons of water, there's no, like, there's no, like, uh, there's no showmanship here. Like, Zim Zalabim or Hocus Pocus, like, there's no showing anything. It's just, it just happened. He has the power to change a lot of water into a lot of wine without any hesitation. You didn't have to touch it. I mean, just if you're getting this, this is serious level power, okay? And he's not showy about it. 
He's not looking for attention. It just happens. He wills it. He just does it. That's, that, that's insane. There's no show here. It just happens. There's no smoke coming out of, of the wine. There's no, there's no like entertaining. It's just, it happens. An extreme miracle happens just like that. Subtly, right? So the master of ceremonies tastes the wine. It's the best wine he's ever tasted. I need to make sure I say this because I don't want you to misunderstand this. Um, I think you know the answer to this question, but we'll start here. Is Jesus is making wine here, not grape juice. He's making wine here, not soda. He's making wine here, not club soda. I mean, whatever. He's not. He's making specifically wine. What does that say about him? Yeah, that, that's exactly the point. Summarized, and that that makes some people uncomfortable. And I want to make sure I want to make sure I say this because. It really depends on who you are and your family background. If you can't, I mean, this, this, is, this is something that I want to make sure I say because this is, I'm guessing, knowing what it's like in high school, at this point, if you haven't done it, you might be thinking about doing it, you're underage, you shouldn't be doing it, I'm not your parent, I'm just saying, I know what it's like to be in high school, I remember. And I'm just saying to you, when you're of age, if you're a Christian, you can drink as long as you can handle the limit. There's a boundary line, and everyone's boundary is different. You'll find out when you get to this, if you, if you do. Um, now, I have to say, just for the record here, I don't drink. In fact, my wife and I, we, there's no alcohol in our house on purpose. We're consciously deciding not to even go there. I don't think it's worth it, to be honest with you. So I, I'm coming from somewhat a perspective that I don't I don't drink I don't I don't feel tempted to drink I have no desire to drink okay um, in part because both my wife and I know people in our extended family who have been alcoholics <clears throat> and dang it they that destroys your life holy cow does that just ruin your life and it ruins people all around you so we've seen. Uh, the effects of drunkenness. There's a reason why, guys, the Bible says don't get drunk. That, that's not taking away your fun. People misunderstand this. It's not taking away your fun. That's protecting you. That's protecting you. That's a boundary. Don't go past this line. If you go past this line, you're asking for trouble, including possibly your own death. Right. So that, that's the case in every, every command of Scripture. It's God's way of saying... Don't do this. It's in your best interest not to do this. It's not God taking away your fun. It's He cares about you. He knows what's best for you. Right? So we don't drink because we've seen the effects of abuse of alcohol. So there's no alcohol in our house. There, there won't be. I'm sa- that's, so I'm coming from that perspective. I'm saying to you, you can be a Christian and drink. We don't do it. It's like playing with fire, guys. Can you play with fire and not, and not get hurt? Can you play with fire and not get hurt? Yes, yes you can. But what, what do you also have to say? It's dangerous. I'm saying playing with fire. You can play with fire. It's, it, you can play with it and not get hurt, but you have to be extremely careful because if you're not careful, it can lead to a huge problem really fast. And that's the same with alcohol. So, to us, it's just not worth it. But I'm, I'm just saying to you guys that when it comes to, when, when, the, when you get to this point in your life, and you will sooner than later, I'm saying to you, if you decide to drink, that's biblically okay, as long as you're not going over the limit. And every single one of you has a limit. You'll find out. Some of you can have one, some of you guys maybe have two, but the is, don't go over the line. If you can't handle it, you shouldn't even go there. That's, that's, I need to say that. If you can't handle it and you know you won't be able to handle it, you won't be able to say no, then don't even go there. It's not worth it to you. It's not. Again, I'm not trying to be your parent. I'm not your parent. But I'm saying if someone who cares about you, this is a real issue. This is a practical issue. You guys will be thinking about this if you're not currently thinking about this now. This is something that's in your immediate future. I want you to know what the, what the Bible has to say about this, okay? You can have fun, have a good time, have a drink. That's not sinful. 
but be very, very careful because it can get out of control really, really fast. And that then you have big problems, not just for you, but people all around you, right? I mean, I just had an encounter with, not, it didn't hit me, but not that long ago, um, I was on the road, this is an example of the danger of alcohol, right? As an example, just a real example, not that long ago, I was on Bayshore Road, North Fort Myers, you know where that is. Um, and I was, it was nighttime, and I saw in a distance a car coming my way, and from a distance it looked like, that person looks like they're on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> that can't be right. So I'm just on alert, but I'm like still driving, and as, as like seconds go by, it gets closer and closer, I'm like, holy cow, they're actually on the wrong side of the road, and they're speeding. Literally, and if you know Bayshore Road in North Fort Myers, it's a huge median. So it's not like you can easily just go into the wrong lane. This is this person made a conscious decision to go on the wrong side of the wrong on the road for a long period of time. It's a huge median in the middle of the road. So this was a huge mistake, and they're coming right at me really fast. I obviously I see it, and I swerve. I get off the road, and they're like zooming by me. No doubt, drunk driver. There's no doubt about it. I'm just saying. There's a reason why you want to play with this if you can't handle it, because you could do something really, really damaging to yourself and other people. Okay, so that's my word on that. Jesus, he's making wine. There's no way around this. Some Christians don't want to kind of talk about that, but the idea is he's making wine. He's providing the wine, and it's the best wine they've ever had. Okay, the wine is more diluted in their day, so there's more water in it than we have today usually. Okay, so we have, in our culture, there's more alcohol in the wine. In their culture, there's less alcohol in the wine. There's more water. But the idea is they, it was the best tasting wine they've ever had. Okay, So I just want to make sure you don't walk out of this class saying, wow, Mr. Eastman said we can drink. And then all your parents like send me emails and I'm going to be fired like, like tomorrow. So I'm making a very clear statement. Don't get drunk. Jesus is making wine, having a good time, but don't sin. That, that's what we're saying. That's my, that's my point. Okay, So it has to be said, though. There's this, there's this balancing act here. Um, this, let's keep going here because I want to make sure you get the next story and you remember verses. <clears throat> the miraculous sign here, this is the first time Jesus revealed something. What, what is he revealing? It says glory here, but what does glory mean? What is that even, what's built into that idea? Power. power. It's the first time he's revealing his power. It's the first time he's revealing what else? His He's not saying he's God. He didn't say anything like, hey, I'm God. Watch me. I'm going to do this. I'm God. He didn't say that. He is showing his power that, that obviously shows he's God, but he's not coming up and saying it <clears throat> explicitly. But yes, I would argue that that could be acceptable. You could say his creativity, his intelligence. I mean, you, just think about it for a second. Can you explain to me how someone could possibly change 150 gallons of water into wine in a moment? Even if you have A pluses in every single one of your classes, you graduate from the school, you go to the, one of the greatest colleges in the nation, whatever one that is, and you graduate from there with uh, 4.0, you won't be able to explain to me how someone can change a bunch of water into a bunch of wine in a moment. What I'm saying to you is he's extremely intelligent, God is, Jesus is. He's showing his intelligence. Somehow, some way, he has the power to do that. Oh, can't explain it. <clears throat> Do you remember I got the purpose of the whole Gospel of John? Does anyone remember the actual the purpose, the explicit purpose, the reason why John's writing any of these stories, all these stories? <coughs> Kaylin? So that people So that people believe. Every story you see, every story you read, is intended to get you to be convinced that he is God. And that's exactly what the disciples, you can imagine if you're at this, at this party, you see this happen. You can imagine your response, what your response would be. The point, though, is that they believe in him now. And I'll keep saying this. What are three other words for this word right here? I want to make sure you got this. Trust, belief. Two more. Caitlin? Courage. Courage. Confidence and faith. So I'll keep saying this until you get it because this is intended to help you know what, like when people ask, do you have faith in God? 
what you're saying to them is, yes, I do. I have confidence in God. That's, that's the idea behind it. We hear, we hear it so much, we get numb to it. Faith, trust, belief. But what you mean is confidence. You have confidence in God. So they had confidence in Jesus here. This last verse here in the story, after the wedding's done, he goes to a different city. He spends a few days with his mom, his disciples, his brothers. Seems like an insignificant verse. All I want to make sure you see again is that he's spending time with people. He's deliberately spending time with people. The more you love God, the more you'll love people. There's no way around this. The less you love God, the less you'll love people. So if you're sitting in, in your seat, you're like, man, I really don't like people. The Bible would say you don't really love God. Much. Maybe you love God a little bit. But the less you love God, the less you love people. That, that There are people I know who claim to be like Christians and, and people who love God, and that they're so rude and they, they're, they don't care about people. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't believe you. You say you love God, but you, you hate people? That doesn't make sense. That can't, that can't be it. You don't, you don't really love God. Maybe you love a false God. I don't know what it is, but it's not the real God. Because the more you love the real God, the more you will care about people. Jesus does this. He spends a lot of time with people. Okay? Let's go to the next story. The next story is review. Okay, we, we actually mentioned this story in a previous context. So therefore, I won't spend a ton of time on it. But I want to make sure you caught this. This story is Jesus in the temple. Let's read it quick, and then I'll ask you a couple questions about it, make a couple points, and then we'll, we'll be done. First off, can someone read this? Carter? Oh. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration, so Jesus went to Jerusalem. <clears throat> in the temple, he saw where he'd sell cattle, sheep, and doves for sacrifices. He also saw dealers at tables exchanging foreign money. Jesus made a whip from some ropes and chased them all into the temple. He drove out the sheep and, and cattle, scattered the money changers, coins over the floor, and turned over the tables. Then going to the people with silver dough, he told them, get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Thank you, Carter. Um, what is the previous context in which we discussed this story? <coughs> uh, it was from the case of Christ. Sarah? And the anger issues were part of a larger sign that he was possibly, Julia? Lunatic. Lunatic. I was going to say lunacy. Uh, but he's a lunatic. Remember, you have options. He's a liar, a lunatic, or a lord. We talked about this, this as an, a possible example that he's crazy. And what I want to make sure you caught is, why is this not an example? Because if you look at this, and you don't, know what, you don't understand it, you might easily think that, holy cow, this guy's got some serious issues. He's taking a whip. He's driving out animals. He's yelling at people. He's turning over tables in a church, which is a very public place, by the way. It's not like you go into your home church and you have like this, maybe a little bit of a hallway or maybe a big hallway, but this is a public area where a lot of people are, okay? And so a lot of people, no doubt, are seeing this. Why is this not an example of him being crazy? I want to make sure you guys got this. It's not irrational anger because people were using the father's name to make money. Or they're, they're selling, they're like, right. what they were doing, they were sinning because they were lying. Because no one really, they were selling animals, you know, for like free sins or whatever, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And that's not what it was, so they're like lying or whatever, they're sinning in the father's house. Okay, so there's exchange of money here. You can imagine that there's business going on here. And the implication would be that the, the business, the money exchanging, the selling and buying is rooted in taking advantage of people, lying, cheating, manipulating people. By the way, that's an example of loving money. The Second Timothy talks about how the love of money is what? The root of all evil. Root of all evil. It's not money. It says the love of money. So we need money, all of us need money. We need money to live, to have a house, to buy food. Obviously we know that. It's not money though that's evil. It's the love of money. It's the worship of money. It's the idea that worst, God, money means more to you than telling the truth. Like, here's the deal. If you're willing to lie to get money, if you're willing to cheat to get money, if you're willing to take advantage of people to get money, then we have a problem because money is too important to you, 
which is happening all the time. All the time. The issue is, that's obviously not okay, but the issue, the main issue is, this is happening in a place that's designed for something else. The main verse here is stop, command, turning what? What is his father's house? The temple. The temple, the temple is what to us today? Church. The church. As we said last time, why does your church exist? Whatever church you go to, and I'm assuming most, or if not all of you, are going to church somewhere. Uh, I don't want to assume that for everybody, but I would say most of you are probably going to church somewhere. And I'm saying to you that whatever you go to church, whatever denomination is, wherever you're going, why does that church exist? To bore you? Because that's what some people think. Oh, man, I gotta go. I'm forced to go to church again. I want to sit home and play video games, but I got to go to church because mom and dad are making me go. That's exactly what I thought before I was a Christian. I wanted to play Mario, right? But mom and dad made me go to church. So before I was a Christian, I was just going because mom and dad were making me go, right? Then I became a Christian, then I wanted to go. But the idea is if the church you go to exists for a reason, what is that reason? What is it? To spread the word of God in church? Yeah. I, I, I'm going to say it's something a little bit more specific than that. That, that's part of it. That spread the word of God so that you're being taught the word of God there. That is definitely part of it. Other? What is, what is the reason your church exists? It's not a trick question. Yeah. So it's a gathering place where you can all like pray and just worship. I, oh, excellent. Gathering, so social people coming together. It's worship and it's prayer. That's that's obvious. Those, those are obvious answers. But that is that's why he's ticked off here. The church that this is happening, it's, in, it's designed to be a place that connects people with God. Instead, what people are doing is they're selling, distracting, taking advantage of people. This is the point. And what I want you to see is a couple of things. One is the same God that we just got done talking about, the God of the, of the wedding, the God who's at the wedding, celebrating people, having fun, providing the drink, is the same God who's super serious about connecting people with God. What I want you to hear is, it's the same God, different aspects of his character. So yes, he's a God that wants you to have a good time. Yes, he is a God who wants you to have joy and happiness and have a good time. He's also a God who's super serious about creating an opportunity for you to connect with God. So the... The idea would be that if you're being, if you're going to church and you're being distracted, that's a problem because church is, intent, is designed to be a place where you can kind of escape and go to have a real connection with the real God. Think about this for a second. If this whole thing is real, if, if all this is actually true, God actually did create the world. He actually did send his son to die on the cross. Uh, he is alive right now. He wants to help you. If all that's real, it would be it would make sense that there that Jesus would here want a place to for you to connect with him. A essentially like a holy place. Holy means set apart. It's a different place, a place that you can connect with him. And when that doesn't happen, he's really ticked. Not to a sinful level, but he's it's righteous anger. The idea is he's he's extremely passionate, guys. Jesus is passionate for you connecting with God. He's really passionate about that. Explains all his behavior here. This seemingly weird, strange, irrational anger. No, no, no. He's, yes, he's doing things that maybe you find is strange or weird, but the idea is he's doing it because he has a fire within him. He wants people to connect with God. Right? So when you go to chapel, for example... It's an opportunity for you to set aside everything else, which is why they don't have any phones there. Don't bring your phone with you. Why? They want to take away your phone? They want you to have an opportunity to connect with God. The most important thing in the world is for you to connect with God. You may think that's boring at this point. It's not. It, it, that the reality is you might think that, but that's what I thought before I was a Christian. 
the idea is you start to realize, holy cow, there's nothing more important than me spending time with God. Connecting with the living God. If he actually is real and he actually is alive, wouldn't you want to experience him more than watching your Facebook page? I mean, there's, it's fine, watch your Facebook page. I'm just saying, the idea is there's something more important than that. And here he is upset because the temple is a place, the church is a place, where people are designed to pray. He actually uses the word pray multiple times in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He specifically says pray. It's a house of prayer. Praying is hard and simple at the same time. It's, it's simple. It's not hard. It, it, in one sense, it's simple because all you're doing is you're talking to God. It's hard because we get so distracted so quickly, right? Even if there's nothing around, even if there's no TVs, no phones, I can speak from experience with this one. There have been times when I, if I've, had, I've had prayer rooms, rooms where there's like literally no TV, there's no windows, it's just a, well, sometimes there's a window, but the idea is you, you eliminate or minimize distraction to enhance your focus on God. And even in that environment, it's hard because your mind goes to, oh my gosh, I'm hungry. I have this huge test. I remember doing this in college. I have this huge test coming up. Your mind gets distracted. Oh, I, that girl didn't talk to me. Now I feel kind of bad about myself or whatever it was. I'd get distracted, right? I'm just saying to you that in a sense, prayer is simple. In a sense, it's hard. The idea, though, is that prayer is a way to connect with God in a very powerful way. And if you're not doing it, you're starving yourself. It's hard because we live in a distracted world. Here he's saying, my father's house was designed to be a place where people go to pray and connect with God. It's not happening. You're distracting people and you're taking advantage of them. Yeah, I'm going to get ticked. I'm not okay with that. And this is the same God that wants you to have fun. He's both. He wants you to have fun, enjoy yourself, have a good time. But he's super serious about you connecting with God and making it an environment where you can maximize that to actually connect with him, right? Watch the response really quickly. <clears throat> Um, the disciples are watching this and they remember a verse in the Old Testament passion for God tells will consume me the idea is this is why he's acting the way he's acting he's extremely zealous he cares a lot about this if you have passion that means you care I feel like if you're passionate about someone or a sports team that means you actually really care about that person or that, that team you care deeply he is very he's caring a lot about God's house here the idea is that God's house is, cons is with people. So you could reword this and say, passion for God's people to connect with God and God's house. That's what he means. Passion, zealous, caring deeply about people connecting with God, experiencing God in God's house. That's what, that's what he means here. It consumes him. It means a lot to him. He cares deeply about it. Like you care about your sports team. He cares about you connecting with God. Okay, watch, this ticks people off. Everything that's happening, it ticks some people off. Who do you think it ticks off? Christians. Oh, non-Christians? People selling. People selling, doesn't say that in here, but you can imagine just logically that people are being driven out of the church and probably ticked. Specifically, who is mad here? Jesus. The Pharisees, and why do you think they're mad? Think about this for a second. Jesus is not yet established. Like He's just getting started here. His first miracle just happened the day before this. So not everyone knows who he is at this point. So this dude who a lot of people don't know is showing up at this massive church and throwing tables around, whipping, throwing his whip around, driving out animals. And the Pharisees are like, what the? Who do you think you are? That's what they're saying. They demand an answer. What are you doing here? By whose authority are you doing this stuff? You, who do you think you are just coming into our church and just throwing stuff around? Right? They say, if God gave you the authority to do this, do what? Drive out animals, throw tables, drive people out. If God gave you the authority to do this, show us a miracle. Right? Who do you think you are, they're asking? That's what they're saying. Jesus, who, who are you? And who do you think you are doing this to our church? If God gave you the authority to do this, give us some kind of miracle. And Jesus is like, okay. He says, all right. You want a miracle? Destroy this temple, and in three days, I'll raise it up. You're going to see this often in the Gospel of John. 
Jesus says something and the Pharisees completely misunderstand it. What do you think the Pharisees think he's talking about here? The actual physical temple. Look at what? It took 46 years to build this huge thing. This place is massive. If you saw a picture of it in the ancient day, it was like it would stand out because it was the biggest, biggest thing in the area, right? Massive church took 46 years to build it, which tells you that technology-wise, they're way behind because nowadays it takes maybe a year to build something. 46 years to build it. They say, you're going to tear this down in three... You're going to rebuild this temple in three days? They think he's crazy. <clears throat> what does he mean by this? Himself. Himself. He says, destroy me and in three days, I'll raise myself back to life. That's what I claim. Destroy me, and in three days, I'll raise myself back to life. They think he's crazy. They think he's absolutely insane. He's not. He's telling the truth. Right? The verses you have for the week are 16 and 17 here. 16 and 17. This is John 2, 16 and 17. Those are your verses for Friday. 